Okay, time to continue this video about function limits and applications. So we were at this slide where we had let, learned the lesson that we had to be careful with scope and binding when uh, translating a math text definition or theorem into first order logic and semantics. So uh, now we will move on and uh, <clears throat> use lim for different things. And um, as a first step, we will uh, look at a little bit of the properties that this lim operation satisfies. So we start up on the left side of this figure where it has a logical statement, except for the for all quantification. <clears throat> it says that the limit of the function f at a, if that's L1, and also the limit of f at a is L2, then L1 has to be equal to L2. So this can be proven from the problem from the definition on the previous slides. We will not prove it here, but it's a good exercise to try to make it more concrete. Because a priori, lim of a, f, and l is a property, um, a, a relation between three symbols, and it's not obvious that the two first would uniquely determine the third. And uh, we already know that it's not always the case that there is a limit for a certain function to a certain point. Um, but this at least tells us that if there is a limit, the limit is unique. There is all the different limits are actually equal. So that means that lim can be used as a partial function. If you've got a and f, you can compute l if it exists. And that means that we can start thinking about different possible types of lim, so lim typing over here. So the first, the red underlined lim, um, that's the lim in the prop propositional sense. So it's a three argument relation. It takes a value of some type x. It takes a function from this uh, type x to y. It takes a y and then it becomes a proposition. Can that even be true or false for a particular triple of arguments? So uh, as we know, or we haven't proven here, but we claim that the property on the left holds, we can actually also view lim as a partial function. And one way of coding up a partial function is the middle type here. So now it's a function given two arguments, x of type x and x arrow y. So that's the a and the f. And then it maybe returns a y. If there is a limit, you get it. Otherwise, you get nothing. And you can definitely work with that type. It's just a little bit inconvenient to have this maybe type on the right hand side. So it's very common that you set up uh, x and y, the types here, in such a way that you always got a limit. And then you get to the blue underlined version of lim, the third typing here. So that just takes an x, uh, an, an a of type x, a function f of type x to y, and produces the limit y. So this is in the context, I remind you then, that we actually have set x and y in such a way that there always is a limit. So the blue underscore version of lim, so you notice here the rend underscore, the not underscore, and the blue underscore are actually different symbols, um, even though they are often uh, mixed up. So um, the blue underline here, uh, we can express that it, it is linear in the function argument. So what does linear mean? Well, here's one way of defining it. So you see here that the blue lim of f plus g with this uh, plus all, the plus with the ring around it, uh, is equal to lim a f plus lim a g with a normal addition. 
So we will talk about what the plus all means in a minute. So this is one of the properties we want for linearity, that addition becomes addition. And the other property is that if you scale the function with some constant c, you make every value c times as big or zero times as big if you want to zero it out, then you could take the c factor out and multiply uh, outside of the limit. So you can compute the limit of f and then multiply the limit by c. And uh, the reason I've made use of another symbol here for addition of functions is just to make sure that we are aware of the different types. So the left-hand side plus little and the right-hand side normal plus are on different domains. So below I've written the type of the plus -l, x to y, 2x to y, 2x to y. So it takes two functions and returns a function. And um, we can implement it as a little exercise here. So f plus g, f and g are assumed to be functions. So that should also be a function. And if we want to express a function, we can say lambda x dot. So it's a function taking an argument x of type capital X, and then it has to return a value of type y. And what we have, well, we have a function f that we, think we can apply to x, and we have a function g we can apply to that same x. And then we can add those two results. So f plus g as functions is f of x plus g of x as a function. So this is usually called a pointwise addition of functions. So pointwise, x is the point. So at each point, we add the values up. So it's a little bit like adding vectors. You add components wise. So this is usually called pointwise addition. I will not give the definition here of the scaling, which is the c times f here, but you can imagine that it's similar. You take a pointwise computation, you, you multiply each value of the function's output by c. So we can see here that we can uh, state the property that lim a is linear, uh, even though there is a different addition on and multiplication or scaling on the left compared to on the right, as long as both fulfill the same kind of laws. So it's, a, it's an addition on the left and an addition on the right. It's just function level addition or pointwise addition on the left and normal real number addition on the right. Well, I guess this presupposes as well uh, that x is actually a subset of the reals. And similarly, y is a subset of the reals. These properties hold in more general settings, but we will not need a more general setting at this stage. OK. Those were some properties. Now let's. Um, put it to use. So a typical case of using uh, the limit is uh, computing or defining the derivative. So this is again a quote from the same calculus book. So this says that the derivative of function f is another function f prime um, defined by this uh, definition. So f prime applied to a particular x is the limit, now this is using the math notation here, of a function depending on age, where x is kept fixed. So this is the defined, this function f prime is defined for all points x for which the limit exists. So if it exists, we say that f is differentiable as x. So with our notation, using the third version, where limit with a little blue underline. We had two arguments, the point at which we take the limit and the function we take the limit for. If we try to write it in that form, we can see down here, whoops, now I shouldn't be moving. 
Okay, we can see that derivative of f at x. So I, I write derivative with a capital D here instead of a post x prime. So the derivative of f at x is the limit at 0 of g. So notice limit at 0 because we have in the definition up here h goes to 0. So what is the function g? Well, that's the expression we have inside the limit declaration. We just made it explicit here that g depends on h and g is its own function. Notice here that g is a function of only one variable, h, but it contains also the x, but that's kept constant here. So we vary h only and not x. Notice also, already in the definition up here, that this expression and this function is not defined for h equal zero. If we try to put h equal zero, we will get a division by zero, which is not allowed. So we have to uh, try to evaluate this at values close to zero and infer the value it should have at zero from uh, some algebraic simplifications. Anyway, so the derivative can be written, be written here as the limit of at zero of this function g. Well, as we said, g depends on more than just x. So if we move to the next slide, um, here we've got a little more detail. So we notice that g is actually a function of more than one argument. So we call that function uh, of two arguments, phi. So phi here has two arguments, x and h. Uh, it gets x, it keeps that constant, and then varies h. And that's what's shown in the limit definition here. So we have defined g in terms of phi applied to x. Okay, so it's still uh, the definition of the de derivative, and we only introduce this new name phi, so that phi of x is the g we had before. So I did this because I wanted to make sure to get a closed expression, a complete definition on the left-hand side. And uh, to get there, we, we have to get it, do one more step as well, because it's still the case that the expression on the right-hand side has one unbound variable, or at, at least the definition of phi looks it has an unbound variable. And that's the f, which is bound in the top level definition, but which I would like to have as an explicit argument. So if we move one more step, then I do two things at once here. First, I say, just as we had g equals phi of x, I say that, well, actually, phi is equal to psi of f. So now I have a function psi of three arguments, f, x, and h. And then uh, this expression, it's defined to be down here. This expression is now closed. I mean, psi could be moved to the top level. We don't have to have it in the local where clause. It's a general function, and the properties of that function is basically determining the properties of the derivative, that together with the properties of limit. So that was one change, introducing phi, uh, psi, uh, such that phi is psi of f. Um, the other thing I've done is that I've noticed that the last argument to uh, Psi, uh, well, not the last argument, the second argument to psi, x. If I use function composition on the left-hand side, I will get the same result. I can fill in the intermediate term here. So it's limit at zero of psi of f and x. So if I have this kind of application where I have, let's underline it. Um, I have one function, lim zero, and I have another function, psi of f, not psi of f of x. 
the other function. Then I can uh, recognize these. Whoops, sorry, I was changing the color wrong. So psi of f, and the green one is lim zero. Okay, so we got the lim at zero <clears throat> composed with the psi of f. And as we said, this psi definition can be moved to the top level. So we actually have now a definition which we can use for the derivative without mentioning the explicit uh, value x or the variable x. So the derivative of f, the function f prime that was mentioned at the top, the function f prime, which we have the notation f for here, I can even write that out explicitly, f prime equal d of f, that's the combination of the limit at zero and the psi function creating this convenient um, ratio between the difference in the function value when we move an age away from x and age itself. Okay, finally, we've got an interesting diagram on the right hand side here, illustrating the types that are involved. So we got started, we will start, uh, it's defining the derivative of f, and that is a function from reals to reals. So we've uh, ignored the, the x and y here, just approximated it to the full set of reals. So the function is from real to real, but it's done in two steps. So first we go from r to another function from r to r. So this is by applying psi to f. So if you apply psi to f, then we get one r value, which is our x. And then we get the function, which is a function of h. So let's write that out. So here we've got an x of type r. That means we've got an as type in that direction. And then this x is mapped to psi of f and x. And if we look what we've got upstairs, psi of f and x is actually the function g. So we we map, uh, and this, this thing has this, whoops, uh, has this type. The type r to r. So we apply uh, psi of f to an x, we get a function from r to r, which is a function of h, and then we take the limit of that function at zero to get the final result r here. So this means that this way of, of building up the definition of derivative means that if we have a library or a sort of convenient properties of the limit, like the ones we've shown on the previous uh, slide, limit here um, and we also have useful properties of this quotient or as you will the function psi then we can uh, prove different properties of derivatives from these two um, for example it might not be obvious but psi is linear in f and lim is also linear so the combination will also be linear so the derivative is linear in its function argument. Okay. So if we <clears throat> move forward, we can see that the type of the capital D here is, well, if we gen have the general setting with very nice functions, it's R to R, or if, it, if we have to restrict it to some subdomain, we can say it's X to Y. But the important thing to note here is we try to make sure that x and y are chosen such that we get a function out of the same type. It means that if the function is not differentiable at certain points, we remove those from x so that we can get a, a function from and to the same set. And um, 
Examples, of course, uh, of functions we can do this for are uh, squaring, uh, doubling, or the constant to function. And here is just a few lines of examples uh, of the results of computing this. Um, so if you take the derivative of the squaring function, you will get the two times function, which is called double here. And if you take the derivative of the double function, you will get the constant two function. And this is now um, first defining uh, these three functions. And then we're showing some of the equalities using the notation for um, sections in Haskell. So parentheses, operator, and then an argument means a, a function which is hungry for the other argument. So in this case, this is the function that squares its argument. So that is the square function. So square function. And this two times, as it says here, is the double function. So it's often convenient to be able to work with uh, these short notations because it's very often in functional programming that you work on the function level, sort of the point free that we talked about earlier. So I will not write here uh, compute why the derivative of double uh, squaring is double and so on, because I want to head in another direction. But uh, and the, the other direction is that. D is a nice mathematical concept, capital D here, for computing derivatives, but it's not really implementable of this type in Haskell. Because if you only have a function f as a black box, we cannot really compute an actual derivative. We will need the source code of f in some sense, some kind of a structure syntax of f to apply rules from calculus. Rules like the derivative of a sum is a sum and so on. That can actually be, we can take that as an example because we have introduced the plus, the circled plus. So the derivative of f plus g turns out to be derivative of f plus L, the derivative of g. Notice that both on the left-hand side, we're talking about the function that's derivative of f plus g not uh, at a certain point x. And uh, these uh, rules are not very useful unless you actually know if a function is written as an addition or not. So that's uh, something we will get to later.